Okay. So I have been a professional software developer for over 15 years. And in those 15 years, I've seen technologies come and go, and I've seen processes come and go. But there are some things that remain true no matter what programming language you're using or no matter what platform you're developing on. And I want to take a little bit of time today, and that's all I have is a little bit of time, to talk about one of those fundamentals, and I want to talk about naming. So depending on the study that you read, a software engineer spends 70 to 80 or even as much as 90% of their time reading and understanding code versus writing it. Obviously, naming is a huge part of readability. But how much time do we actually spend training people to make readable code? I took a look at my introductory programming book from several years ago, and it spends less than half a percent of its time talking about how to name things. Even if you look at texts that are more specific to that subject, like clean code or code complete, they spend maybe four to five percent of their time on naming. And it's mostly pedantic things like how long should a variable name be, or capitalization rules, or coding conventions. For the most part, we have relegated naming to a few simple platitudes. For example, use meaningful names. OK, true, but oversimplification. I've only known about one or two developers in my entire career who actually named their variables A, B, C, and D. For the most part, names do have meaning. And for the most part, people use meaningful names. But just because a name means something, and just because a name means something to you, doesn't necessarily mean that it means the same thing to everyone. The goal should be that your variable names or your class names have the same meaning to everybody who reads them. Take, for example, chips. I can talk about chips because it's after lunch. Uh, what a chip means to me maybe isn't the same thing that it means to you. And obviously, this is a contrived example, but we run into this time and time again with overloaded programming terms. For example, a process. Are we talking about a series of operations, or are we talking about an instance of a program running on an operating system? A controller. Are we talking about a general orchestration component, or are we talking specifically about a class in .NET Web API for handling HTTP requests? A cursor. Even if we know that we're in the context of a long-running search, are we talking about an indicator for the user to know that something's taking a while, or are we talking about an identifier into a set of, of search results? Another one of the principles is consistency. And this is generally a good principle. However, consistency among bad names leads to consistently bad names. Don't blindly follow simple principles, and don't blindly follow bad coding conventions. So another, an actual example of this is a class that was created in one of the projects that I worked on that's called Correlation Computed Call Values. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's actually not a bad name at its root. What it was was it had an external dependency for calculating correlation results. And when that happened, we got a callback to a method called onCorrelationComputed. And we stored the values that we got in that callback in this class. It is literally the values from a call to correlation computed. It's a bit literal, but it made sense to the person who wrote it, and it made sense to the person who reviewed the code. However, it didn't make sense to everybody on the team. Somebody knew that we were talking about correlation results, saw the name, and separated it as correlation computed call values and assumed that computed call values was a term that meant results. So it wasn't long until we had cluster computed call values and trend computed call values. And none of these actually came from a callback, let alone one that was called computed. But we were stuck with this name that came from somewhere else entirely. And it eventually led to even more interesting naming when ReSharper started trying to rename our sets of call values is. So what can we do? How can we find better names? I spent the bulk of my career as an API developer, so we had to come up with a lot of names. And some of them were better than others, but all of them became part of our commercial product. So we actually got to see how other people interpreted the names that we came up with. And over the years, it turns out that the most useful tool in our arsenal was actually a thesaurus. Not only is this useful for 
getting over those situations where we have overloaded terminology, but we also found that it was actually really helpful for helping us narrow down the definition. Let's go back to process in the context of an actual algorithm. If we look up process in the thesaurus, we get a whole lot of related names, or a whole lot of related terms, but there are a few that really stand out that actually have something to do with what we're talking about. We went to something like an operation or a procedure, and procedure is pretty descriptive, but it's maybe not the greatest name. So if we go through and we look at procedure itself, we actually start to see something really interesting. If you look at it, there are two words here, program and steps, and those are really focused on the actual order of something happening and the actual algorithm of this step and then this step and then this step. But there's also method and strategy, which is kind of talking about the general whole of the operation. So if we're naming something like computation process, we have to look at what it actually is. Are we talking about a method for computing something, which could be, say, an enum value or a setting that we're specifying, or are we talking about the actual operation itself, which maybe is a task or a subroutine? And the thing is that both of those words come from process, but they're very different concepts. The other tool that we found was actually brainstorming, because if you want your names to mean something or to mean the same thing amongst multiple people, the best way is to actually include multiple people. And with a co-located team, sometimes we would actually do this around a whiteboard, and we would write up all of the ideas and start discussing them and narrowing them down and removing outliers and coming up with the best solution. But we've also been able to do this just through a chat window on, on an internal messaging system where everybody starts throwing out ideas and people discuss those ideas. And in the end, we actually come up with something that's better than what anybody started with. So this is actually a real world, very recent example. I think it was about two weeks ago. We had a class that was provisionally called test data client. But when we went to write unit tests for it, we realized that it was going to be test, test to data client. And that was less than ideal. So we started coming up with names. And it was based on cloud storage, so a cloud storage client. It was hard-coded data, so maybe hard-coded data client, fake data client. But at this point, somebody pointed out, wait, it's not actually fake data. It's real data. It's just not live data. So, you know, zombie data client, it's undead data, uh, training data, and we kept coming up with names, and we came up with as many possibilities as we possibly could. Some of them maybe not so helpful, but write them down anyway. And eventually we got this fairly extensive list. And then we started cutting things off. And one of the benefits of having client client face is that it gives you a really easy starting point for starting to cut the list. Because probably nobody's going to complain too loud when you cut client client face off your list of options, no matter how clever they thought they were when they came up with it. Uh, and then there are some more technical cuts. Hard-coded data client was a little bit hard to read. Training data client made it sound like we were talking about machine learning. Cloud storage and file data client, probably a little bit too closely coupled with the implementation. And we came back to fake data client. And the thing that somebody liked about this was that it's obvious that it's not for production code. Nobody's going to use fake data client by accident in their production code. But it came back to the whole, wait, it's not actually fake data. So that led us to look over at sample data client and demo data client. These are probably not things that are going to be mistakenly used in production code, but they don't have that limiting factor of fake data versus real data. And in the end, we settled on de demo data client, and it exists in our code base to this day. Uh, extra click. And the last thing is don't be afraid of change. With the tools we have in modern development environments, it is almost trivial to do refactoring. It is so easy to rename something that there's really no reason to stick with something that isn't clear to everybody. If you see something and you don't understand what it is, first of all, ask somebody. Don't make an assumption that computed call values is a fancy word for results. And don't be afraid to rename computed call values to results, if that makes sense. So in closing, I want to acknowledge that yes, this takes time, and yes, naming things with spending time on naming things can be a little bit of overhead effort and upfront cost. But at the end of the day, it's probably going to save you a lot of time and probably a few headaches down the line. And finally, I want to leave you with one more name, and that's mine. I am Meg Gottschall, and thank you for listening.